Okay, well, good afternoon or good morning or good evening. Welcome to Justice Talks. My name is John Hill. I use he, him pronouns and currently serve as the General Secretary, the Interim General Secretary for the Board of Church and Society. Uh, for those joining with visual impairment or those listening to the audio recording, I am a middle-aged white uh, man with dark blonde, graying hair, wearing a blue blazer and a light check shirt. And then behind me on screen is our Church and Society logo and our mission statement of living faith, seeking justice, and pursuing peace. Um, we're so glad you have joined us today for our third installment of Justice Talks for 2023, uh, From the Pulpit to the Public Square. If you've joined us before, welcome back. If you're new, uh, we're so glad that you found your way to this webinar, and you can find recordings of our previous Justice Talks on our YouTube page. And we'd love to know where you're joining us from. I know a lot of folks are putting that into the chat, so feel free to do that if you haven't already. Uh, before we get started with our conversation, I do want to let folks know if you have a question, you can submit that by clicking on the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to answer them either in real time in the chat or at the end of our conversation today. And at this point, just a special thanks to Amber Gaines, who is working the behind the scenes magic for this webinar and helping us to field those questions. And with that, I'm excited for today's Justice Talks and to introduce you to our two conversation partners, uh, the Reverend Stephanie Arnold, who serves as the senior pastor at First United Methodist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, in addition to that role, we're fortunate that Stephanie serves on the board of directors for Church and Society. So welcome, Stephanie. And also with us today is our very own Reverend Kendall McBroom. Uh, Kendall serves as uh, the, on staff at Church and Society as the Director for Civil and Human Rights. Um, so welcome to both of you and thanks for your willingness to be a part of today's conversations. Um, you know, if, if as, as we begin and we reflect on the situation in the world today, to say that these are challenging times is an understatement. Um, from the ongoing war in the Middle East, the increased polarization and dysfunction in our government, um, we know that some, some states in the U.S. are going to the polls today, and even as that's happening, efforts to roll back voting rights. Uh, certainly, we've seen a proliferation of legislation that seeks to roll back protections for the LG, LB, LGBTQIA community. Uh, we see with the mess that the federal budget is this year, efforts on almost every spending bill to defund any programs that uh, work for diversity or equity and inclusion. Uh, and just the ongoing narrative around the humanitarian crisis at the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, across all these issues and, and so many more, the public discourse, and if we're honest, sometimes the conversations in our own families, uh, sometimes the conversations in the pews uh, can be divisive and can be prone to using or certainly hearing language that dehumanizes others, that uh, fails to, the, to honor the image of God in our neighbors, in those we disagree with, and those whose lives might be very different than our own. So today we wanted to spend some time in conversation with Stephanie and Kendall about how we as people of faith might engage these conversations in the local church, in our communities, and in our advocacy so that we might both as a goal, but also as a practice, really honor and protect the dignity of all God's children. Um, so, Stephanie, I wanted to start with you. First, I gave a very brief introduction, so I want you to feel free to uh, tell us a bit more about yourself, and then a bit about the church uh, that, that you're serving and how your faith community is engaging in the work of justice. Sure, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I adore the work of GBCS, and this is a real honor. Um, so, I, if, if uh, you're visually impaired, then I'm blonde, blue-eyed, middle-aged woman, um, been born and raised in Alabama all my life. I'm sitting here in my office in downtown Birmingham. So First Church, the congregation I serve, is in the heart of the financial district in Birmingham, Alabama. We're about two blocks from 16th Street Baptist Church uh, that was bombed during the, the civil rights movement. Um, I've been a part of the First Church community for about 13 and a half years. The first eight years I served as the associate pastor, and then for the last five and a half years, I've been the senior pastor. And I would say First Church really, in, in 2009, this church had gone from in its heyday, so think of it's a 151-year-old congregation. And so in the 20s through the 40s and the 50s, it was one of the largest churches in the Southeast. Um, the pictures we have in our uh, 
store uh, historic room and the sanctuary just show it packed. It seats about 1,200 people and there would be standing room only. But the time of transition, in particular, the impetus of the civil rights movement and the changes in downtown Birmingham in the 60s, 70s, 80s, created a lot of white flight. And this church significantly decreased in size. And people went over the mountain in the Birmingham area. And, and during that time, um, things just changed. They changed in our culture and they changed in the Birmingham area and they changed in our churches. But, but I'm not sure First Church was real intentional during those seasons about how to address that change. And so by, by the time 2009 hit, this church was probably just a few years away from having to close its doors. So it had gone from being one of the biggest to living off of its endowment funding and, and really struggling, not having a mission. And it created a new mission statement in 2009, which was to be an open place for all and really began to sink its teeth into what, what it meant to be open in a diverse community in downtown Birmingham and, and what it meant by all, like who, who might be included that they hadn't included before. And, and really with the, the formation of that mission statement um, and the desire, I mean, that was an honest conversation with the congregation. And I think the realization that if they didn't find a way to like meet their current context and to have their faith be relevant in the face of all that was going on in society, this church probably was going to become a historic landmark in body only, but not have a presence. And, and it really, I think, just began from there. Uh, piece by piece of leaning in and and looking around to say who's missing from this congregation because there there was a lot there's still plenty missing from our congregation now but um, that authenticity to have the conversations about who should feel welcome in church and how church should engage the society around it I think is what led to this congregation being revitalized we're now we for years we we've been a church that um has felt it was honest and authentic to clean our roles, which uh, a lot of churches don't always do that practice. So we're 619 members now, but but we average about 350 um, people attending in person on Sunday and about another hundred virtually. So you know, percentage wise, that's a healthy congregation. So we're we don't have the the same numbers we did back in the 20s through the 40s, but it is an actively engaged congregation. And I would say in the last 13 years, the the call for justice and having a faith that um, really works to how to have restorative justice and to learn about that and and the, the truth that all people belong are the things that bring people and draw them into our community here. And Stephanie, I'm, I'm wondering, as you worked through that um, mission, your revitalized mission statement, um, were there particular you know, topics or challenges that the community was facing that you were engaged in that uh, allowed you to sort of live that out in the community? Yeah, I mean, I think, and, and I'll be honest, I wasn't here in 2009. So I came in 2010, about six months after they had created that mission statement. And the senior pastor at that time who had led them through creation of that, you know, what he said to me, literally sitting in this office um, back then when I was thinking, you know, I was on leave. I had two young kids at home who weren't in um, kindergarten yet and plan to stay off um, until they were. And and then I met him in this church and, and he said, Stephanie, you know, if you come to work here, you're going to be in a congregation where in the pews, you're going to have CEOs and presidents of the banks around. You're going to have unhoused folks who've come in off the street looking for respite. You're going to have black people and white people. You're going to have gay folks and straight folks. And so if, if you want to be a part of a church that has that kind of diversity, then this is what you should say yes to. And the truth is, I don't know that that every Sunday we were all of those things, but I believe that when they created that mission, it was looking around the downtown community and seeing evidence of those people's lives in our city um, who who didn't have really a safe place to turn often in the form of a faith community. That That's why they, they created that mission statement to address that. So for us coming out of that, I would say the, the first kind of um, civil and human rights issue that we sunk deeply into became LGBTQIA inclusion and, and rights. Um, and then, and then from there, once, once we began being active in one 
in one area of people's lives, it just rolled and rolled and rolled to including more. Thanks for that. Um, so it, given sort of what I laid out as a challenge we're facing right now in, in the public discourse and in the conversations, even more you know, familiar conversations in our families and, and communities, what, and, and a lot of this, I feel like there is certain media framing that we, that the algorithms are sending our way, right, to sort of reinforce things that we might believe. I'm wondering, with this division, what suggestions you have or advice you would give to pastors as they consider how they might engage in these issues, right? Either preaching from the pulpit or if that it might be in small groups and conversation to introduce these, uh, the, the conversations that are so relevant in the lives of so many folks. You're asking me how, how to help someone begin to introduce those into their congregation. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, I, I, there are several things I think about that. Number one, I would say to somebody, and, and this is, <laughs> I'm saying this to myself as much today. I literally went and made a hospital visit today um, in the midst of everything, because it doesn't matter to people what you have to say as a pastor if you're not showing up um, in the pastoral care ways that that are impacting the people that you're ministering to their lives, right? So you can have all these awesome, wonderful things that you want to think and say, or biblical insights or whatever, or small groups, but you got to do that other. And, and even if you're more passionate about one, um, I would say you've got to do that first because the old adage of people don't care what you say unless they know that they care about you. Um, so I think that I think that holds a lot of water um, with this. I think listening to the things that are actively impacting your congregation. You may have a passion to start on a topic, you know, that's near and dear to your heart. But if that's not what is impacting your congregation, you're going to you're going to get you're not going to get as far down the road. So I'll be honest, I didn't come here <laughs> nearly nearly who I am today. Like this church has shaped me. The people that started coming to First Church have shaped me um, into who I am today and what's on my resume. All of that is because of ministering with, with these folks. So hearing where people are impacted in your pews. And then I think, you know, the way you start addressing some of that, if they'll tell their stories, people care about the people in the pews more than they care about their pastor most of the time, right? Like, you'll take on you'll take on your staff and take them to task more than you'll take on one another because y'all have got that lived equity of marrying and burying and baptizing one you know one another in community and so for those folks who feel they can speak about the issues of justice that are impacting them letting them have the mic and lead in that way are really helpful and then you can come as the pastor behind that and I love our Methodist quadrilateral. I find that it hardly ever fails me. So, you know, tradition, what does our tradition say? And I mean, I'm somebody who I am comfortable pointing out like where I think we've gotten it wrong as a United Methodist church or as a Protestant faith, um, as the, you know, church universal, like where have we gotten this wrong? Um, and if that feels too uncomfortable, then just simply asking the question, like, could we have done it different? Did we miss something? What have we learned today that might impact if we had this decision to make over again? So you could form it in question so it's not so um, confronting to people if that's where you need to start. Your experience, that's where you pull in your own lived experience, the experience of your congregation, th the spirit of leading you through your ability to reason, like what, what makes rational sense here, um, and then scripture. And again, much like I do with tradition, I think it's really important to say, um, okay, this is this is what we've always heard scripture says about this issue. Um, or, hey, scripture actually doesn't address this issue at all. So what can we take contextually from the context of the Bible and apply to this? Um, and then just to dialogue with it and to point out to people, you know, when, when you start with issues where like everyone's going to agree, right? So the Bible has a lot to say about slavery, and it's not real uh, uplifting. Matter of fact, we would say it's wrong today. Most people aren't going to argue with you about that. So if you can stand on that solid ground, then it allows you to open up the context of Scripture and begin to look at other issues that people may not have been able yet to see. Huh, maybe, maybe there's more to that, or I can look at that a different way. But I think Leaning on that quadrilateral allows us from the pulpit and in small groups to give people tools for how to dissect and engage on issues that they might otherwise think, well, there's no place for this within the walls of the church. But we as, as United Methodists actually believe there, that there are faithful ways to address it.
Amen. So I want to bring Kendall into the conversation. So Kendall, I did a very brief introduction for you, so feel free to introduce yourself further. Um, but I wanted you, I know as the Director of Civil and Human Rights, you engage in policy work around many of the areas that I talked about at the introduction from immigration, criminal justice reform, death penalty, LGBTQIA rights. I'm wondering, as you look out in your portfolio and you kind of hear the, the discourse, um, certainly at the, at, uh, among decision makers and the media, I'm wondering if you hear or see some common threads or even some common threats to the way these policy proposals are seeking to roll back rights right now. Yeah, thanks, John, uh, for that question. And, and Reverend Stephanie, thank you so much for laying that foundation that you have on the ground level. Um, and I really, I really echo and sit with the sentiment of uh, that old adage, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And um, the people in the pew do care more about each other than they care sometimes about their their pastor uh, in the Methodist tradition, right? Um, so uh, my name is Kendall McBroom, and and as John stated, I serve as the Civil and Human Rights Director at the General Board of Church and Society. Um, my pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm a uh, Black American with a beard and curly black hair and um, and around the 30 year old mark. Um, and I'm just grateful, grateful to be here and grateful to, to be a part of this work. Um, so to the question about the common thread a, as laid out earlier, um, we are really seeing if we're, if we're honest, we're seeing, uh, both an attack and a rollback on the liberties and the rights, um, that so many of us have grounded our understanding and even grounded our hope in uh, for this country, for, for America and the world that we would like to see. Um, and so with that being said, uh, one of the common threads that I see is a really a, and it, it touches on something that you mentioned earlier, is the the dehumanization and the, and the seeing the other or seeing those that aren't like us as less than and therefore not worthy to have or worthy to participate, uh, whether it be with voting rights in the whole project of democracy, uh, whether it be with immigration, um, security and the opportunity to see asylum, um, if it is criminal justice, uh, the the opportunity uh, for a second chance or a third chance or um, or a restorative process with the death penalty, um, the 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 understanding or the interpretation that an individual cannot come back from this, and then um, and what what kind of is the irony and and the the crossroads for for uh, the work that we do is if we are a faith one a faith agency and we are the church and we believe in a redeeming God. Um, and if we still hold to the fact that the United States, uh, while not specifically a Christian nation, um, uh, tends to uh, view itself as and identify itself as a Christian nation um, for better or for worse, um, that that wrestling of of who is redeemable, who is uh, say, who 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 has who is able to obtain salvation and liberation and again these liberties um so with that being said that's the common thread that each of these portfolio issues um uh, are really attacks on the the dignity and the image of an, another individual or of of our our siblings um and, and and again even with when we mention lgbtqi rights I can think through a host of bills that were introduced in this legislature, uh, in this legislation, this session, um, that really, they remove the humanity out of the picture. Um, not to talk about the divinity that lies within each of us, but they remove, they remove and ignore the humanity um, of, of our, our neighbors. Um, and so, so those are the common threads, uh, uh, the lack of, the lack of one humility, but then the lack of of honoring and respecting uh, the humanity in the in the other person. So, so with that, Kendall, I'm wondering, you know, as you're engaging 
the conversation both with decision makers at the you know, and and we work in the United Methodist Building across from the U.S. Congress, so often at the federal level, um, or connecting with conference and church leaders. What is what have been some effective ways that you've seen folks pushing back against these policies, proposals, even reframing them, um, and maybe that's equipping you know United Methodists or people of faith with. Uh, biblical framing, or I'm just wondering if, if you could share some ideas for folks about how we might be able to to push back amidst this divisive and dehumanizing discourse. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I, I need to touch on touch on a part of that or and as a lead up to answering the question um, that I one Methodism has been running through me forever, I believe. Like my daycare was Front Street United Methodist Church in Burlington, North Carolina. Um, I attend and was ordained in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, so I have that lens and now, of course, working for uh, an agency, a general agency of the United Methodist Church. Um, the that, that Wesleyan Quadrilateral is a, is a help for me, is a tool for me when I think about engaging in policy, when I think about engaging in uh, uh, letter writing or, or, or even uh, some of our action alerts that we that we produce. When I think about even in conversation with legislators and the staffers, um, the approach to having those conversations, I, I use that as a tool. Um, and, and I kind of switch it up a little bit. The way I switch it up is that um, I kind of lead with what is the experience of the person, the people that I am in community with, um, and the, and that community is not only just um, the coalition partners and, and us as United Methodists, but but really the the conference staff or members of the church who will reach out and want to have a conversation or reach out to share um, what they're experiencing. And what can the agency do legislatively, advocacy wise? Uh, so I leave with that experience because I think that's, I think before we know anything about scripture, tradition, or even the cognitive, you know, our cognitive abilities, we have to see people and listen for where people are at. Um, listen to their stories, listen to their experiences. And I think that, that humanizes us and it humanizes them as well because we're able to make these connection points. Um, so that to me is is very key. Um, and then when it comes to like scripture and tradition, understanding the context of that, um, I, I think even so much with our with our, our sacred texts, with our, <laughs> with our sacred texts, um, we have to we have to understand what are out of what has this what was this text birthed out of what context was this text birthed out of what what nuances are there what what intricacies are there who was at the table at the council of nicaea uh, upon those things you know and i know that's not everything that the everyday lay person in the pew would would maybe even want to know or understand but i think as clergy and as advocates in a faith tradition we have to be able to take that information, break it down and make it real on the ground um, for the lay person to understand and even fellow clergy persons to understand how we are at and why we are at where we're at. Um, so I think through that, but then also uh, one of the scriptures that has, as we're talking about like um, the effectiveness and equipping and, and the framing I I keep going back to a couple of a couple of scriptures and and I'm gonna just just gonna name two of them and then I'll I'll return it back to you, John. But the first story I think about is the story of the five daughters of Zelophehad, and that that has been sitting on me. I know we talked about it in, at one of our one of our sessions and and webinar or seminars services, um, but that just has stuck with me um, even before then and and even until now because. We have a people, we have five women, really, who are at a disadvantage uh, from obtaining justice and obtaining uh, what was rightfully theirs. Um, but they're trying to go through the process of the law. They're trying to go through the process of the community. Um, but even as they're going through their, these processes, they have this 
faith, this ultimate faith in God, that, that the God that they serve and the God that their fathers serve was one of justice. Um, and so I, I, I bring that text up because I think that helps ground, that helps ground and frame why we do what we do or, or why I do what I do is and how I engage in this civil rights work. And then the last one is uh, more on a spiritual note. Um, the scripture that says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. Um, and I think we have to be honest about the fact that that this is not just uh, what we can see, but a lot of the things that go behind the policies, the harmful policies um, that dehumanize our siblings um, are those things which are otherworldly. And we've got to call those things out. We've got to be able to engage in that conversation and have that conversation. Um, uh, yeah, we've got to be able to have that conversation and and tie that into the to the work and the framework. So, Stephanie, I'm wondering you and totally um, open it up if you want to respond to anything Kendall said because I want this to be a conversation. But uh, I'm, I'm curious about how some of the policies or the proposals that we've seen and the sort of narratives that are at the federal level, the national narratives here in the U.S., how those are impacting folks in your own church and in your community yeah. and kind of how you are engaging that both from a pastoral sense of care and also um, to, to be a voice for justice and change and to challenge some of those narratives. Yeah. Um, I'll see if I can give y'all a, a few examples. Um, recently for us, um, this, this past year there, we had a, a protest at the state Capitol here in Montgomery, Alabama, obviously was statewide called drag me to the Capitol because we were having some state bans on, um, drag and some laws that were really infringing upon the rights of trans persons and the LGBTQIA uh, community. And so now for us, I mean, at First Church, and I get it, I've seen some of the questions, like, I would totally understand that not every congregation is where we are when it comes to inclusion and being able to talk or even or even feel like you have community and access with folks within the LGBTQ community. Um, but that, that's been one of those places that First Church has been doing that work for over a decade. And so we've kind of We've built, um, I have a son who works out all the time, right? So I've got images of working out and building muscle. We've been building muscle when it comes to lifting in that area. So when that started happening here in our community, I've got, I've got chaplains at local area hospitals. I've got trans folks in my church. I have got non, non-binary students in my youth group and in my children's ministry. And so when laws were coming into, coming down the pipe that were saying, people aren't going to be able to have adequate health care to meet their needs of, of their family. And when we know the suicide rates um, within that community, when, when they are not accepted and when their lives are threatened, then that's an issue like for our church that was easy to activate on, right? Um, and, and for many others. And we've got, if you go to our website, you can see under our ministry, it says Justice and Mercy. And First Church has really decided to do partner ministry over the years. So we don't try to duplicate what others in the Birmingham area are doing well. We try to partner with them. And so Magic City Acceptance Center and Mag Magic City Acceptance Project here in Birmingham works with the youth, uh, the LGBTQ youth. And so they were really getting, putting, pushing people to go to the Capitol. So we loaded up and our staff and church members went down there and participated in that. And um, that that's just one recent, recent example. Um, First Church has participated in the Women's March. Um, in 2016, this was another really seminal moment for us. We had a, a young mother with um, eight children who sat on the front row of the service that I preached um, every week. Who uh, She was murdered in an act of domestic violence. And um, while all of her children survived, several of them were also shot. And that was, you know, one of those moments where okay, sure, everybody had heard of domestic violence before, but I mean, it hadn't been talked about. And did you know anybody who was actively living with that? And it was immediately on the forefront of our congregation. Um, and so we we began, I had a number of church members um, who went into foster care training then to actively engage within that system. And we worked within our annual conference um, to 
to write a resolution um, that would require, or it's aspirational because you, you can't really hold each congregation's feet to the fire on it, but that would say we were going to all participate in domestic violence training um, every three years in each congregation so that people were actively learning what the signs were for DV and, and having access um, to professionals in that line of work. Um, in 20... Was it 18, 2017, 2018, the city of Birmingham were having a lot of ice raids. And there was just some really terrible rhetoric, uh, as, as there's continued to be, um, about immigrants and refugees. And so our church, we, we don't have a Hispanic um, population that, that's of any significance at our church, but it is in the surrounding areas of Birmingham. And we wanted to go ahead and dive into that and begin looking at, okay, well, hopefully our church grows in diversity. And so how are we going to handle if the downtown community may be having ice raids? How do we want to offer protection to people? And so we have an attorney here within our community who helped us draft a, a sanctuary policy, um, kind of helping us lay out what we would and wouldn't ask um, and how we would respond if um, ICE showed up at our doorstep and wanted to to engage and see, you know, who was inside our building. Um, we since since we have begun to work on more justice and advocacy, we we have tried to just look at those issues that are impacting the community around us and find ways that we could take a step towards it, right? It's not, you can't do it all. Um, and it, it so easily never feels like enough, but to begin to engage and get people thinking and, and making even small decisions um, begins to move the needle in a positive direction and helps us shape our faith um, and our political discourse uh, together in sync. So I want to get, there's a lot of great questions in the Q&A, um, and I don't know if we'll get to all of them, but I wanted to touch on a, on a couple of them. And Victor asks, and this is what's addressed to you, Stephanie, but I feel like both of y'all could talk about this because um, you both referenced the Westlane Quadrilateral, saying how I appreciate the use of this as our starting point. Is, our starting point is always scripture. How do we as United Methodists use the quadrilateral to educate folks the importance to go from the pulpit to the public square as often as it is seen as political. So how how do you all, and I think that's just one of those questions we get consistently about, um, you know, and I always reflect on who defines what as being political, and, and I feel like that's an ever-shifting landscape. Um, but how, how do you kind of, how, how would you encourage folks to use the quadrilateral or otherwise engage folks from moving out of, of sort of the local church context and into the public square? I, this is one of my favorite um, aspects of ministry to me. I, I feel, unfortunately, over the years, our United Methodist heritage and tradition has really gotten watered down. And as a United Methodist clergy person, I will own that I think I think we are greatly responsible for that because I do not think that we have well articulated the fact that the United Methodist uh, faith and tradition is really rooted in having that public discourse. I mean, John Wesley did not back down from engaging in what were seen as controversial topics um, that had political ramifications. I also know right now politics is terribly divisive and ugly, ugly, ugly. Totally get that. Yet the heart of the word politics and what it means to me is not a dirty word. It it is it is people living in community together. It is you know brushing up against other folks and needing to have conversation and build relationship around what are our shared values going to be. And it doesn't mean we always have to agree. Um, back to the dehumanization. Unfortunately, today we we have gotten ourselves so polarized that we don't even know how to come together on on things that we actually do kind of stand on solid ground. Um, but I, I go back, there it was in 2012 in the book of resolution, there was a statement that said just really beautiful language. I, I won't read the whole thing, but there's a part that says United Methodist, the United Methodist church believes God's love for the world is an active and engaged love, love seeking justice and liberty. We cannot just be observers. So we care enough about people's lives to risk interpreting God's love, to take a stand, to call each of us into a response, no matter how controversial or complex. 
The church helps us think and act out a faith perspective, not just responding to all the other mind maker uppers that exist in society. So for me, as a United Methodist, it is part and parcel that I engage my scripture, that I also engage the politics of my world. And, and I don't have any desire to keep those separate. There's a difference in engaging in the political arena from a faith perspective than standing in the pulpit and telling who, someone who to vote for. That's not what I'm talking about. But our social principles, um, the, the facts and faith cards that GBCS gives us, I mean, they all help inform us on a faith perspective as United Methodists. That the truth is, I think um, the United Methodist Church would be leading from a much better place today if all of our us as clergy actively practiced preaching from that perspective and teaching small groups. And when you're telling someone what it means to be United Methodist, you're saying this is what it looks like. We are a denomination that engages in society in this public arena from a faith perspective. So that's my that's my two cents, <laughs> which is a lot more than two cents. No, I, I I just want to echo that, but I and add to that, um, add to it that this notion of politics or being political as a dirty word, um, it is it is really kind of as as Reverend Stephanie was saying, it's it's how we negotiate our space, negotiate resources within the world. And as Christians in particular, United Methodists specifically, or Methodists specifically, we are speaking or where we are rooted in this ethic of of grace and this ethic of love um side note grace over greed campaign that we are leading at gbcs feel free to to support us in that um but i i really i do tr i earnestly believe and know that uh when we root that our our political action or in our, our our advocacy our organizing when we root what we do in love in grace um, that will shift the way that we see the direction or even our engagement uh, with the policies at the local, state, and even the federal level. And there I say on a global level with you know the United Nations and, and humanitarian aid and all those things. Um, so I, I say that to say that the, the quadrilateral, like we can move from scripture to action, right? Because... Uh, we see, we have those as examples. We have the scripture as examples, right? We have it as, we, we see that individuals who we taught, who we are uh, reading about actually did something about the context that we're in. Going back to the, to the daughters of Zelophehad text, they go to Moses, right? And petition Moses, um, uh, to petition God through Moses for their justice and for their rights and for their 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 land for what was theirs. So um so yeah that the the examples are there. Biblically and even in other, you know, as we think about this work of the work of justice and and again the political aspect um as we work across faith traditions, as we work across different things, um that that ethic of love and grace has have to be there. Um if we are who we say we are. So I want to uh, get to another question, and and Neil asked this about um, address it to Stephanie. I want both of you to reflect on this about common values uh, that you all see as most effective that that are shared across class and lived experience in your congregation or in your Kendall in your work. Um, are there shared practices that bring people together across differences and strategy to stay committed to the long vision of justice? So it feels like how are you building? What I hear in that question, um, and y'all can interpret it your own way, of course, um, I'm hearing like, how do we build movements um, within our congregations, across our denominations, within our communities um, that cross some of those lines that divide us um, to sort of reflect the vision of justice that we want to, to see? That's a really good question. Um, so, you know, and some places are easier to do that than others. I think I'm a part of a interfaith group here in Birmingham. Um, so it's folks from uh, the Muslim faith to the Jewish faith to Protestant to Catholic. Um, 
but it's really it's common commonality is that work of justice. So I I would say in that group there is a, a progressive leaning um, around how to engage from from our different faith traditions in the work of justice, and and that's been I mean there you know uh, the current struggle uh, or war between Hamas and Israel. I mean that we worked together to draft a statement um, that you know was was supportive of peace and took into great care the loss of life on all sides. But but that was work. Um and, and I watched those folks like really struggle with how do we how do we do this? So there's things in held in common and then there's still differences in perspective. It, it gets it gets hard um I feel like around that political divide when when you feel like there's bigotry and there's oppression and there's violence. And so I, I'm not sure that that I've got the answer to how you how you stand together when you're so diametrically opposed and, and there is true, true harm that is happening. But I do think I, I do think we, you know, as people of faith, um, and, and I believe in a loving God, that that we have to stay grounded in in that act of not dehumanizing people, even people for whom we vehemently disagree and who do heinous things. We have to still see their humanity, even when, when they may have lost it. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, the other divides here in Birmingham, there are a lot of socioeconomic divides. And again, sometimes we do that better than we do um, at other times. It's it's really hard, I think, for people who are in more privileged positions to always know how it's going to feel or what is helpful, what is not helpful. And so the more often we can have a dialogue and a table with people from different perspectives represented, then those of us who don't have that perspective don't have to try to act like we can speak for or think for those who do. Um, but it, it takes a lot of work of, of building relationship and coalition. And I will say just anecdotally for us at First Church, um, one of the things we found is we couldn't just do the justice work. That That's what draws people here. That's what's important. But you can't just do that and have those relationships. You got to have you got to have fun. You got to find ways to have fun with one another, to laugh with one another, to do something silly. Um, and, and that seems like maybe outside of the realm of what we're talking about, but I feel like that is what builds sometimes the equity and the endurance, the perseverance to be able to go the distance then. But if you're only diving into the most consequential, difficult, hard subjects of our day and age, then then you're not having abundant life. Um, and and your, your ability to do that long term, I think, is going to be much, much shorter. Yeah. Um... I had a point and unfortunately it has flown out of my mind. Um, but I, I think one of the things that, that has to, and I'm, I'm pulling this from um, something I, I just saw in the chat about solidarity. Um, I think when it comes to, yes, this work and, and, and to the earlier question about what ground, what connects us, right? Regardless of our political affiliation, regardless of um of of a host our socioeconomic status and things of that nature i think that that we in a in an attempt to get to solidarity uh one of the things that i think that grounds us as methodists or should i'm assuming again connect us as methodists as methodists where you're whether you're in united methodist african methodist episcopal african methodist episcopal zion christian or methodist episcopal is this Honing in this strong, deep belief in God's grace, in the grace of God. Um, I think where we differ is how that grace is expressed and how that grace is uh, viewed and seen. But the notion of God's grace is, is there. And I think if we could rally around, have conversations around that, discussions around that, vision around that, um, in connection with the life, the life and the lived life and lived experiences of Jesus um, and our neighbors, we might can move things forward and and kind of address this this strong divide. Um, I, I think as it relates to kind of the solidarity aspect and and getting to a place of solidarity, um, we really you know in in all of our traditions, 
really have to come to terms with the truth in, in our own histories, in our own stories. Um, you know, we, we look at it now and, and even today, uh, 200 and, and some years later, um, we still have this big division within Methodism. Um, we've not fully acknowledged the history of why there is, why, why are there pan Methodist con denominations, right? Um, and so again, that goes back to the, the, and help, trying to understand what we stand around in, in, in God's grace. Um, I, I think there's this sense of people want to feel a belonging. Um, and we've got to deal, we've got to wrestle with what does that belonging look like in our own context before branching that out to, to the world. But it's not to say that we can't do both at the same time. I am a strong believer that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, and as we are wrestling things out, working things out, we can also work on the advocacy and, um, the advocacy things and justice issues of our time. So I want y'all to to reflect on this question from Gordon. Um, he says, how far out in front of the congregation does a pastor walk? Must the fire build from within first? Do we build on a fire or start the fire? And I'm just wondering if y'all have a, a, a reaction to that question. I, I don't think it always has to be one or the other um, all the time, right? Uh, there are things that, I mean, there are things my congregation is further out ahead on me, ahead of me than I am, and and I learn from them. Or certainly congregants, right, from within the church. But there are other times. I mean, unfortunately, not every one of my church members gets you know fifteen to twenty minutes uh, to stand up and to deliver a sermon to me every week. <laughs> um, but because of my position, that's a privilege um, that I get. And so I, I don't think it's helpful. And I say this as somebody. Um, I'm, I've had to learn this lesson, right? Like you can think you're right and be so far out in front, but if you're not bringing anybody along with you, it doesn't really do a bit of good. Matter of fact, it may do damage. And so I think, I think when you are out in front, being that leader who is constantly looking to provide ways to bring people along, um, to, to teach and to learn and to stay humble enough that you recognize you're always learning too, because you, you can think you've arrived at some place or have some understanding of justice, but we, we live in a world that is constantly evolving and changing. And so the language we need to use is changing. The experiences of people, the opportunity for having different voices, you know, come to the microphone, all of that is changing. And so you, I think there always has to be a level of humility. Um, to me, it's it's just shared leadership. That That's the best approach. But I I would I know I wouldn't feel comfortable if I felt like my congregation was dragging me along the way all the time and they wouldn't feel comfortable if I was the one dragging them. So I think I think it has to be a mutual approach where you share from your experience and you learn together uh, at a pace that is challenging um but yet that we can all uh, move largely as one going forward together. Yeah, I um, challenging. I, I I like what Stephanie said about that. Like Reverend Stephanie said about that, challenging, but that we can move together on because, um, I, I don't think it's a it necessarily it doesn't necessarily have to be a tug of war, but kind of an ebb and flow, right? I think it's more like an ebb and flow, like the water. Um, so I and I, I bring I say this as a as someone who served a in a parish ministry, um, for three years and two of those years during the pandemic, I remember that we did. Uh, a public policy clinic, and we basically engaged with uh, young adults and youth, and adults were able to to participate as well, but particularly like the young people, and they were engaging with their legislators, with their elected officials, and and one of the things I did was I, I let them choose the topic, what what was burning within them, like what frustrated them, what were they passionate about, and the responses were all very. But there was still this understanding that we're going to do like there was this empowerment that we can actually do something. We can say something. We have a voice to say something. So in that vein, I say you really have to take a temperature pulse, take the take the pulse and the temperature of your context and congregation to know how should I move and what direction should I move um, in 
in in advocacy work and in in speaking out in legislation. Also, something that is hard, I believe, and difficult for us as can be difficult for some. I, I don't I'm not saying it's necessarily us on the panel like me and Reverend Stephanie, but uh or even United Methodist pastors or Amy Pastors. I'm not speaking specifically, but I think that broadly speaking, it can be hard for us as Christian leaders, Christian pastors, to take a step back and say, I don't have to always be in the front. That someone else can I can die I can have a different role in the midst of this movement in the midst of this advocacy work I can walk alongside I can be behind and support the the members of my congress but not to always have to be in the in the front um I think I think we we've got to really work on on that to be effective and to bring people along um because again going back to the solidarity piece the people that come along and work with us while at the when they first are introduced to this work might not necessarily be United Methodist, but I can guarantee you if they see us doing these things, they're going to want to inquire. Hmm, this is a church and a community that is actually doing things that I believe in, that I have faith in, that I want to see happen. I want to learn a little bit more about this, and might become not only just members in the pews and members on the rolls, but active participants in the work and ministry and life of Jesus Christ. So. So we're, um, we have just over five minutes left. I do want to ask you all to, to um, sort of answer this question that's been in my heart for a while. It, and I, I hear this from others. I certainly feel it in myself. There is this sense of exhaustion among folks. I feel that particularly among United Methodists in this seemingly endless, endless quadrennium that we have been in and the seasons of disaffiliation we have been in in the U.S. and the season of politics that we've been in. I'm just wondering how in the midst of these tiring times and times that for some folks are are um, very threatening and, and folks are feeling being impacted by these policy proposals directly, like how do you all stay engaged? How do you stay awake in the midst of all of this? Um, and Stephanie, I feel like you touched on that in finding like places of joy and celebration and Kendall talking about, you know, how you're building kind of a sustainable movement that one is a part of and not always leading. But if you could just give some other ideas and maybe it's maybe it's a word of hope, but just how you all stay engaged in the midst of the exhausting work. I think you've got to have space where um, you get to set that down. Right. And if a community, I'm talking about close friends or your family, wherever that is, where, um, you know, you're you, you don't have to you get to be vulnerable and you get to be raw and say what you need to say, uh, make a sarcastic joke, uh, not be the, you know, spiritual one. Um, you got to have those safe spaces and you got to go to them regularly. For me, the other one, and I really felt this during the pandemic, and I recognize that there is certainly a level of privilege um, in saying this, but for me, travel um, is really key. And and that, that doesn't have to be like, a, you know, across the globe, but, but getting out um, from your just community where everybody knows you for me, reminds me, most of the time I go somewhere new and I'm having to ask directions or explore something new, most of the time I find out the world is not what the news tells me it is. Not that those things aren't true, not that I don't need to care about them, but what I am constantly reinforced by is that the world is still a good place and most people are still kind and compassionate. And travel gives me that gift and reminds me of that. Um, and the other thing I've learned for myself is I'm an only child. Um, and so even though I've got children and a spouse and friends and all that, I still need quiet. And so I can feel it in my soul when my pace has gotten so fast and is always with others that I don't get the time just to have a few hours a week where I can just sit outside and, and listen um, to the birds and the wind and the trees um, or stare at, at some water at a lake. I, I, I just need quiet and, and creation um, to help keep me grounded and rem to remember that I can't fix it all. It's not all mine to fix. And that, that life is still good, even in the midst of great pain and suffering. Yeah. Um, 
I echo traveling to the, which might be that privileged position, but, but definitely getting away is, is an aspect. I've also really been tapping into, um, reading a lot about bell, reading a lot of bell hooks and reading a lot of Howard Thurman, revisiting the Howard Thurman works from, from grad school. Um, Jesus and the disinherited and mind and heart, head and heart. Um, because I think there is something about, there's particularly something about that literature that really grounds me and lets me know that one, broadly, it's not going to all be done within my lifetime. Like I might be 80 or 90 years old and we'll still be going through maybe the, some of the some certain things, but hopefully they will not be the same thing uh, or even a different iteration of the, of this thing, but that we'll have new problems. and new challenges um versus these that we that we have today uh another thing for me that really grounds me and gives me hope um and it might be it might sound contradictory but um being at my grandmother's house in north carolina um is that safe space for me um it is a place where i can sit at the feet of the elders and learn and laugh and um be myself be just just be to just be and and here again hearing the stories right of someone who uh has lived through the 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 early jim crow era and the civil rights era and the crack epidemic and um multiple administrations and multiple sessions of you know congressional sessions but still to receive and feel a sense of encouragement and hope that uh, to not grow weary in well doing uh, for in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. And that to me is what is given is given hope. Um, that to me is what is giving life uh, in the midst of so much that is going on around us and even the work that we do. Thank you, Kendall. That is going to be our closing word. I really appreciate both of you and appreciate the audience. We had so many questions and we didn't get all, to all of them. I feel like some of those questions were themselves reflections. So I'm grateful for how you all contributed to this conversation. Uh, again, thank you to Amber for managing the chat and all of the behind the scenes. Um, and yeah, just grateful for a, a really rich conversation in this season of, of uh, such important work and ministry.